weather. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being with us on this beautiful uh, sun, uh, June morning here. I'm Bob Challoner. I'm the president and CEO of Southampton Hospital. And uh, I'd like to welcome all of you and talk a little bit about what we're doing here today. I do apologize for the folks that had to wait outside. We just, uh, we do have pretty strict uh, fire marshal here in Southampton Village, as many of you probably know, and we're limited in terms of who and how many we can seat, not who, but how many we can seat in here. Um, and uh, this is clearly a topic that is of interest to many, many people. Um, this won't be the only time we're doing this. So um, if anyone, if any of your friends or neighbors hear about it, weren't able to come, we will be doing um, additional sessions as well. And the other thing we'll be doing is uh, CTV, our friends from CTV are um, uh, uh, airing this, uh, recording this, and it will be broadcast on uh, CTV here in Southampton. And, and I believe we'll be doing it, uh, LTV will be airing it as well. So today's session will be available for anybody who was not able to make the, uh, make the, uh, the session this morning. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of introductory remarks, and then I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, this Tick Resource Center that we have developed here at Southampton is something that's really emerged from the voices of our communities. Um, many, many folks over the years have asked for information about um, tick-borne diseases. We see people in our emergency rooms, we see people in our doctor's offices, um, we're asked frequently about, about information. And the flood of requests has just grown to the point that we felt the need to, to organize that in a, in a, more, um, a more formal fashion and create this Tick Resource Center. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what we intend to do with the Tick Resource Center and, and what we don't intend to do with the Tick Resource Center. Um, and our, we have really three goals um, as an organization. Um, number one is to, to gather good information. And unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation, as there is with any healthcare topic out there. But we are going to look for good information that's evidence-based, um, researched, and um, make that available to you, or, or find sites that we can make available to, to all of you and essentially become a clearinghouse for, for information. And we're very much in the early stages of doing that. And uh, we expect that over time that, that clearinghouse of information will, will grow. Um, but a place where people can call and get information generally about uh, Lyme-borne or tick-borne diseases. Um, as part of that, we'll have a telephone number, um, uh, 726 726 TIC, T I C K, which is 8425. The information will be in the handouts that we have. Um, Debbie Mala, who's standing over with the with the pink blouse, um, is the is the voice of the Tick Center. So Debbie is an infectious disease nurse, um, and she will take questions and uh, and answer any uh, uh, questions and also direct you to the appropriate resources. Debbie is one person, so sometimes you'll probably get voicemail, but Debbie will be uh, will get back to you if you leave her her number. So one is becoming this clearinghouse of, of good information. Two is we really want to be able to provide education, and it's two types of education. One is to the, to the general public and to make information available to all of you. Uh, many people are concerned about um, ticks and tick-borne diseases, and it's frightening, frankly. I, um, I moved here eight years ago. I live in the northwest woods of East Hampton. I probably pulled 20 ticks off myself last year and, and hundreds off of our, uh, our dog. And um, uh, it is, it's, it's not an issue that I ever, I don't even think I knew what a tick looked like before I moved out here. And every time you get one of these bites, you worry about it, and there's all of these new diseases that seem to be developing, so it's frightening. So we want to, we feel the best way to, to improve health in our community, and the best way to combat fear is through, through information. So we will be, uh, we will be coming an edu educational vehicle for, for the communities here on the, on the South Fork. Uh, to that end, we will be doing an multiple um, sessions. Um, we've already been asked by a number of the libraries 
Um, our doctors have graciously been um, traveling to um, uh, libraries and community centers around both forks, actually. And you'll see more and more of us uh, as we get out there. And our goal is to do this free of charge. This is something that we view as a public health epidemic and that's something that we need to take a leadership role in, in getting good information out there. We also are, will be providing education for our um, physicians and our medical community because many of our doctors are struggling to try and keep up with what's happening out here as well. Um, and uh, uh, the, they, they are also being barraged with questions and, and good information and bad information. And, so to that end, we've already had one session with our medical staff. Um, we brought in speakers from the outside, some of our internal experts. We're working very closely with um, Stony Brook University uh, Medical Center, um, which has a major center for Lyme research. And um, we will be continuing to strengthen that relationship with Stony Brook and other experts to help improve the knowledge of our medical um, community as well so that um, when you see a local doctor, you can be assured that they have good information as well. And that's been a request from our medical staff. So education is clearly a major part of our agenda as well. And then the third function, which we are in the early stages of developing, and Debbie is really that initial resource, but we hope to develop a navigation uh, function as well. One of the, the first questions we hear is, I need to get to somebody. I need to find a doctor. Something's wrong with my kid. Something's uh, happening. I don't know what to do. And um, one of our goals is to develop a uh, navigator, find a, find this we will need funding for, but get a uh, funding for a full-time navigator who can work with people individually and get them to the right uh, right medical resources. We've done it in our breast cancer center. We have a, some of you probably know her, Susie Roden is a patient navigator and, and, and folks that have been diagnosed with breast cancer, Susie's job is to make sure that they get the resources that they need and she's been very, very effective. So that model we would like to use as well and that will be our goal. Um, Debbie will initially be, you know, uh, taking questions and trying to direct people, but this is something we expect the need will grow and we are going to be seeking some funding to do to, for that role. Um, what we are not, we do not intend to establish a clinic, a uh, tick clinic and become a treatment center. Um, we have many, many uh, medical resources in our community already. And rather than create the overhead of a, of a new clinic or, or center where we're providing treatment, our goal will be to utilize the resources that we already have available to us, help educate them, help strengthen what they already have available, and then direct folks appropriately into, into those resources. So um, uh, we will not be, uh, if, if you look for an appointment, we will be directing you to a, to a local, local physician and helping you find a, a resource that, that works for you. Um, we also do not intend to become our, our own research uh, function. We will be supporting, and Dr. Dempsey is already involved, um, uh, in, in some research um, and we'll be supporting some of the research that's happening at Stony Brook, at, at Rockefeller University and other places and um, eventually you will see us likely reaching out to people in the community. One of the, one of the things that the researchers need is access to, to folks that have had Lyme disease so they can take blood samples and do things so they continue to advance the research. Um, and we will be uh, reaching out and trying to serve as a front line for volunteers for, the, for that function and anybody that would be interested in it. There's a lot, as you will learn, a lot of, uh, lot of unknown information about uh, Lyme diseases. We've started this in, in tick-borne diseases much more than I realized. Um, so much more research is, is needed, frankly, and uh, we, we do intend to support that, but not to do the actual, actual research here. So education, navigation, and, be, and becoming a clearinghouse will really be what we're about. Today, um, I'd like to just make a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping comments. Number one, um, I'll introduce the panel in a second. We're going to ask the panelists to speak. Each has about 15 minutes presentation. We're going to ask each of them to speak and we're going to ask to hold <coughs> questions until they are done. 
Um, there's just not enough time to, to stop with, with questions. Um, we'll do that at the end. Anybody who is worried about forgetting your question, we have pads and, and pens up here. Write them down. And after all of the panelists are done speaking, we will, we will ask, uh, take questions. And you can direct the questions either to an, an individual or the panel as a whole. Because we're recording, we'd like you to stand at the microphone over here so that people that are watching at home can hear your, hear your questions as well. So that's, uh, that will be a part of what we're doing. Um, and I think that is it in terms of housekeeping. Um, we will also, my job today will be to, to keep the questions moving. I would ask that if you have a question, some people rather than ask questions like to make lengthy statements. We'd like everybody to have the opportunity <laughs> to ask questions. Please keep them brief. Um, and also today is not a marketing opportunity for anybody. This is a chance for people to get good information and questions uh, with our panelists. So if anybody's here and wants to market something that they're selling, we would ask you please not to do that um, in, today's, uh, in today's session. So, and I'll, I'll try and keep things moving as the questions happen. Um, as, if you start to write out a paragraph, please cut it in half and we'll, <laughs> we will, I'll certainly uh, interrupt you. Let me um, introduce our panelists. Um, We'll start off today, we have Dr. Rajiv Fernando, um, who is the Director of Infectious Diseases here at um, Southampton Hospital. Dr. Fernando has taken a lead role in the development of this. Dr. Fernando will be speaking about Lyme disease, its background, history, signs, and, and symptoms. And uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Fernando as one of the only infectious disease uh, doctors out in this end of the island. Uh, Dr. Tony Knott, some of you probably know Dr. Anthony Knott from his uh, work out in Montauk. He will be uh, talking to you about uh, Lyme disease as the great imitator, unusual presentations. Dr. Knott is, uh, has seen a tremendous amount of, uh, of tick-borne diseases in his practice out in Montauk and has, has developed quite, a, quite an expertise uh, himself and as a family practice physician, we'll, we'll talk to you about some of the experiences he's seen. Similarly, Dr. George Dempsey, um, he's with East Hampton Family Medicine, will be talking about tick-borne disease and the emerging pathogens, all of the other tick-borne diseases that we are starting to see um, associated with ticks. Um, Dr. Dempsey also, um, because of where he's practicing and his own interests, has is, is developed a tremendous uh, base of knowledge and has done a, 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 taken a real leadership role with us and has made himself available um, to speak to community groups and is also leading some research efforts uh, and partnered with, a, with Stony Brook and, and some other universities. So, And then finally, uh, Jerry Simmons is a physician uh, assistant in East Hampton Family Medicine and, and Jerry's going to be talking about, he's had a long history of working with patients. Uh, with tick-borne diseases, and he'll be talking about prevention, protecting yourself <coughs> at home and outdoors. All of our panelists are doing this on a volunteer basis. Um, every once in a while we get them together and talk about ideas and give them a, a free dinner, but that's, that's it. So I really want to thank all of them for the time that they've, they've devoted to this so far and the commitment that they've shown. I think we're lucky to have them here. So. Further introduction, let me introduce Dr. Rajiv Fernando. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming in on this uh, Saturday morning. Um, I'm obviously the, the new kid on the block, so I'm gonna, I have uh, three very esteemed people on my panel. Um, so I and my role today is going to be to uh, summarize, uh, you know, what we, ha we have had historically with uh, Lyme disease, and um, uh, my other colleagues will be elaborating uh, on 15 minutes. So my role over here is to discuss this in the next 15 minutes. So firstly, let's start off with where, um, when, how long have we really known that Lyme disease exists? And it turns out that we've actually isolated uh, Lyme disease from, uh, from tick fossils as long as 15 million years ago. So it's really been around that long. Uh, surprising to know that it was, uh, we started reporting cases only in the mid-70s, and uh, 1986 was the first year where uh, Lyme disease was a reportable illness. 
Since then, uh, we, the CDC has been reporting uh, 30,000 cases a year annually, uh, but took a very steep uh, increase between 2000 and 11 and 2012. They, 2012, they actually reported 30,000 cases, and 2013, they reported uh, 300,000 cases. So um, I, I suspect there's something a bit fishy over there, and um, yeah, I, I doubt it went up tenfold. Uh, but definitely, it's, uh, it's, I, I suspect there are much, much more cases out there. And we are in the uh, thick of things over here in Long Island. We're the number one part of America which has tick-borne disease, and hence the role for uh, the hospital and uh, us getting together as a physician community and the hospital and all of you here together. So uh, let's start off with, um, th those are the numbers we have. And uh, my role over here is to first tell you um, that some of these ticks actually, we'll talk a little bit about in, in a few minutes, but some of these ticks are actually uh, triple infected. So it's just not Lyme disease. About 20 to 25% of our ticks over here actually have uh, three tick associated tick-borne illnesses as well. So it's not, uh, not just, it's important to think about other pathogens as well in this situation. Now, uh, after a tick bite, now this is a very uh, common uh, uh, question we have, and I'll lead, leave it to my colleagues to discuss this further, but uh, uh, what we have is, it's important to understand the tick has, uh, and I'm sure all of you have heard this, and uh, my, my role over here is to try to explain why this whole 36 to 48 hour rule applies. Uh, the, uh, upon a tick bite, what really happens first is uh, the tick actually, it, uh, it has its mouthpiece, uh, mouthpiece uh, that it bites you, of course. The first few hours you get what's called, you will have an itch, and that's what's called a tick hypersensitivity. Uh, the uh, salivary glands of the tick, and it's a hypersensitivity reaction to uh, to uh, to the skin, and that's why you have this itch. Now, where does this does this 36 to 48 hour rule come come in? And that's really because upon after biting you, it uh, the uh, the Borrelia, the Lyme disease uh, pathogens, are actually in the mid gut of the tick. So it really takes uh, a while to you know m migrate from the mid gut of the tick to the mouthpiece. So the, that's a pretty good uh, rule. So that's where we are. So you need this 36 to 40 48 hours to uh, to transmit the disease. Now, where are we at? Now, let's talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms, which you're all uh, aware of. I'm not going to spend any time on that because uh, we, the community, have experienced all these signs and symptoms. Let's move, and my colleagues will uh, talk more about it. Uh, where are we with treatment? So it turns out that Lyme disease is caused by a pathogen called Borrelia burgdorferi, and turns out it's with in this era of multi-drug resistant bacteria, um, where we're running out of antibiotics. Quite frankly, in uh, hospital-acquired infections all over the country. Fortunately, uh, Deborah does a wonderful job to keep that at a, almost non-existent in our hospital, but. Um, uh, spirochetes turns out it turns out the the bacteria that causes Lyme disease is such a weak fragile organism uh, it turns out you can use drugs that were re really um, really released in the 1960s good old penicillin doxycycline amoxicillin cefuroxime these are all drugs that were released in the 1960s and 70s and turns out the only the most important thing, and that's what we're trying to do over here, is uh, have a physician panel uh, with um, uh, a general medicine doctor, a family medicine doctor, an allergist, a rheumatologist, a neurologist, and all your calls that'll be coming in. Uh, we're going to be able to be uh, to be discuss this as a as a group. Uh, I don't think it's important for you know for physicians to have any sort of ego or anything like that. The bottom line is all of us want at the end of the day we want our patients to get better, and that's why uh, we've established this group to discuss amongst uh, if there's a rather challenging case to discuss it amongst ourselves and make sure that the patient gets the best care. Now. Um, so you can, that's the treatment. Really, you can treat vir vir virtually anything. The important part is for the physician to have an index of suspicion to order the Lyme disease test. Now, always remember, your Lyme disease serologies always take anywhere from two to four weeks to turn positive. So if you, if you have a, a rash, and always remember, if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it's a duck. No rocket science over here. If you see this rash, you don't need to you don't need to do anything. All you need to do is see the rash, start the treatment. See the rash, start the treatment. See the rash, 
start the treatment. That's all you need to know. Um, moving forward, and uh, you can request the right thing to do, and obviously we'll be having physician education as well, is to um, do the blood work in about four weeks. Nothing earlier than that. The other uh, tick diseases, Ehrlichia, Babesia, Anaplasma, is an evolving pathogen, which is called Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a new pathogen that we've identified. It just behaves just like Lyme disease, and that's why one, one of the reasons it causes your Lyme disease test to be negative, because there's a cousin of Lyme disease that's out there. So it's important for your physicians, and uh, we are actually calling primary care doctors all over the island uh, to make sure that this summer they'll be ordering these tests appropriately to, to diagnose these conditions. After, uh, those are the, the four uh, types of tick disease and the newest one, which is a fifth disease called Borrelia miyamotoi. I can assure you that this summer uh, we'll, we'll be all over the panel, we'll be all over Long Island, or the eastern part of Long Island, and we'll be making sure to take care of all of you. And uh, as Debbie mentioned, um, uh, we do have a line, and I, I personally take responsibility to make sure all of your calls are answered within 24 hours. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say uh, is, like Mr. Challen, uh, Challoner mentioned, um, you know, I think it's important uh, to grow in uh, research. And uh, I know we're, we're working with Stony Brook. We have some fantastic people associated at the, at the tick, TBDA, Tick-Borne Association, and Lyme uh, Disease Research Association. And I'm very happy that we're moving forward. Long Island is the key where there is tick-associated diseases. I don't even think in Manhattan. You know, people talk about tick disease in Manhattan. There aren't any ticks out there. Um, they, you know, it's, it's important that we have everything here and uh, you know, that's, that's critical. So uh, we're moving forward with all these research associations in Stony Brook just to make, uh, make sure your care is better. So thank you well, once again. Thank you all for coming this morning, and I'll be happy to talk to you soon. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. I'd also like to introduce uh, Karen uh, Wolfrat. Where is Karen? Okay. Karen is um, uh, a, co a coordinator um, who's also been putting the program together today. We'll also be another resource for you, um, and we'll uh, focus on getting information as well. Karen, thank you for your good work. Um, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Anthony Knott, um, family practice physician out in Montauk, um, who will be talking about Lyme as the great imitator, unusual presentations. Thank you. And thanks for everybody uh, coming out this morning. I know it's a nice day. Um, Mr. Challoner mentioned the, you know, the anxiety that's associated with Lyme disease um, out here. And, and there's real reason we have an environmental problem on the east end of Long Island. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about perspective uh, before getting into some of the atypical uh, Lyme cases. I'm just going to give you some examples that I've seen. Um, I've been in Montauk 10 years and sort of had to grapple with, you know, uh, a number of uh, foolers uh, that the Lyme disease as it came to me as I wasn't expecting it. I remember when I was a medical student, my first year of medical school, I had a ganglion cyst on my wrist and I was almost 100% sure that it was a cancer. Um, and I went, uh, I went to the, and it was a ganglion cyst. So I went to the doctor simply, uh, you know, I think I had a cough and, um, you know, 15 minutes into the interview, I, I held that out and go, what is that? You know, almost assured that I was going to get that bad diagnosis, but she said, oh, that's a ganglion cyst, forget about it. And I was like, oh. Um, so, go, you know, going to the physician, sometimes you just go for reassurance. Um, and, uh, and for information, that's a big part of the visit. Uh, when I moved out here and I used to see my kids playing in the grass and I was starting to see Lyme cases and I see Brendan, my son, out back wrestling with the dog, you know, I'd be in the kitchen, I'd be banging on the window saying, Brendan, no, um, because, uh, you know, I had just been exposed to Lyme disease for the first time and I became quite anxious, you know, on his behalf and, um, uh, didn't quite understand that perspective of things. So I do, I know that uh, a lot of people come into my office uh, very anxious about, about the possibility of Lyme. I think that Lyme is uh, treatable, certainly. Um, there's a lot we don't know, as, as Mr. Challoner has said, but I think 
uh, you know, aside from these atypical presentations, the one thing that I would say is that if you don't understand what's happening or if you have a change in your health or you have a, uh, a rash or something new that's happening in your health, and it, it doesn't have to be Lyme that you might be worried about, but come to the doctor early. Because I think that's uh, treating Lyme early is, in my mind, you know, practicing for 10 years, kind of the number one thing. So um, the rash, you know, the, the tick, uh, tick bites you. And I have seen so many different types of rashes that, and at first, you know, you look at the textbook and we're all, we all have, you know, privy to these pictures of the Lyme disease with this red circle you know, four or five centimeters. And after uh, two or three years, I just completely discounted th those photographs. Any rash that I saw pretty much that came into my office, especially, you know, from June, July, August, September, uh, I had to think of Lyme disease. So um, this, the erythema migraines, the very earliest stages of Lyme, 50, 60% uh, may, may get this and the other 40, 50 percent may not, so it's not a reliable, you know, indicator, not a reliable marker for Lyme. But if you do have a red rash, the bottom line is, you know, come into the doctor and, and look at it rather than assume that, oh, this doesn't look like, you know, Lyme. Because I've been fooled, again, my experience, I've treated rashes initially when I got to Montauk as if oh, this is this has got to be an infection. This is not Lyme. This is some kind of you know we call it a cellulitis where the skin gets infected and even there there could be blistering. Uh, it just looks red and and not like the textbook at all. Uh, so in terms of these atypical you know Lyme presentations, that would be the very first one that could fool us. Um, and you might think, oh, this is, uh, or even you bumped yourself, you know, you get a bruise behind the knee, um, armpit under the breast and the groin uh, and the buttocks behind the knee, you know, these are the places we see these rashes and they don't necessarily look like the textbook or like some of the pictures that we see in the, uh, in the, uh, the pamphlets there. So, um, you know, from the point of view of those, you know, out there deciding whether or not to come to the doctor, just come on in. Uh, I was out before uh, my tenure here in Montauk, I worked in the public health service in Arizona amongst a, a native population, and while I was out there, they just happened to uh, be experiencing a syphilis epidemic, which uh, we don't normally uh, see these days, but for whatever reason, there was a syphilis epidemic. So we uh, got the experience of seeing a number of cases of syphilis in the various stages. Syphilis used to be the great imitator of modern medicine. Now it's Lyme disease, and it's no uh, uh, coincidence that they're both caused by a form of the spirochete, this the bacteria. Uh, syphilis out there would also uh, the, the rashes would, uh, would not look like the textbook, um, and uh, all sorts of signs and symptoms occurred. And what we did as providers out there, we just started to test everybody and um, we're, you know, became surprised at how many positives that we were getting on uh, you know, rashes that, well, that doesn't look like syphilis to me. Uh, so, so the doctors out here, our responsibility is to have a high index of suspicion to think of it and same as you guys, and I think uh, I have two extremes of patients. Um, those that never come in, you know, uh, that leave, you know, I hear the ambulance going by uh, after they'll have something going on maybe a month or two and just won't go into the doctor. I probably would be like that. Uh, or, you know, the patients that would be very anxious and come in, you know, for any little thing, you know, the eye starts to twitch. But th these are extremes. Um, but I would say, mm, I, I would probably err on the side of caution during the summer um, and just at least get our, get our opinion or get, uh, get the opinion of a healthcare worker. The um, Lyme, uh, so other organ systems that Lyme can infect, uh, the central nervous system, um, and this is, uh, you know, part of what makes Lyme a fearful experience for us out here on the East End. Um, these type of infections, which put in perspective are quite unusual and not common at all. 
So, so the atypical Lyme, uh, it's not as if we see this every day. I may see you know, one or two cases of Lyme meningitis each year, um, but it's, it's not that common, you know, these, these type of more severe Lyme cases, but they do happen and all the more reason to come in early. It's, that's, that's really the bottom line. But um, some examples that I've had of foolers, uh, I had an elderly patient that uh, we, myself and the family were, were quite certain she was just experiencing the middle and late stages of an Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's dementia, um, became Sometimes Alzheimer's can progress rather quickly, so she became more confused. Uh, uh, you know, the memory started to go a lot quicker over you know a three or four week, two or three month period, and she was placed in a nursing home. Just before she went to the nursing home, uh, for whatever reason, we we did a Lyme test. When she you know was in the nursing home, the Lyme test came back positive, and it was it was pretty positive. So we started to treat her uh, in the nursing home, actually with IV antibiotics at the time. I thought when she was you know, remanded to the nursing home that, that would, you know, I wasn't gonna see her again. She walked into my office three months later talking and uh, all those symptoms had, had pretty much reversed themselves. Um, and I don't, I, one thing I don't wanna do is to be alarmist in, in telling you these these kind of cases because they're so unusual, but just by way of saying, yeah, Lyme is the great imitator and we just have to be mindful of changes, you know, and, and it, would, it would more often uh, occur in a, in a short time period. Uh, other, uh, you know, we have carpal tunnel syndrome, you know, that's quite common, for instance, and this is a peripheral nerve, you know, this is the wiring and the, uh, at the side of our body that becomes uh, compressed, really. That's what carpal tunnel syndrome at the wrist, and so you get numbness and tingling in your hands. Very common. Uh, and I've had a couple of cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, quote unquote, that turn out to be Lyme disease. And that the, with the treatment of the Lyme, the symptoms go away, the numbness and the tingling, and sometimes weakness. And I've had variations of that too, you know, these uh, how Lyme can affect our wiring you know, how our nerves and our hands and our feet, and, um, uh, but, it, but it can uh, be a little insidious in that even, you know, the doctor will think, gee, that, that really sounds like carpal tunnel syndrome. Since we see that so commonly, um, you know, you, you have to think of the Lyme out here. So, uh, so I think it's great you guys are here because you're empowered to, to get this information, and I, and I do think it helps you know, with the doctor-patient uh, uh, relationship that if you have this information and you can actually talk about it and go, hell, could I have, you know, I've been bitten by a number of ticks this summer or, or a couple months ago, what do you think about a Lyme test? So I love when patients do that to me as I say, you know something, let's, let's tr test that. And a couple of times the patient has told me We've done the test and it turns out to be Lyme disease. So it's one of these uh, problems, you know, you, you have to be uh, humble about, certainly as a doctor, but um, to, uh, to be aware of what's going on and just come on in. Um, I think to educate yourself about these, you can, just like I Google atypical symptoms of Lyme, and I, I get my information by going to the computer and trying to educate myself on a regular basis, and you guys could too. Uh, sometimes it does, you know, to have the medical opinion helps to um, waylay your fears, you know, and, and to, uh, because if you start to imagine things like I did as a medical student, uh oh, this is cancer, you know, when it was just a cyst, um, uh, that, that's really helpful. So rather than to get into any further uh, atypical presentations, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Thanks. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Dempsey from East Hampton Family Medicine, who will be talking about tick-borne disease and emerging pathogens. Hi there. I'm going to have to, I think, uh, sit down to be near the microphone and run the slides, but uh, I'm going to stand here. Or I can, uh, can I do it from here? I have to do some moving around. But um, I can move this. But, um, 
What I'd like to do is, uh, I'm the science guy, and I'd like just to give you lots of information, and stimulate you a bit, and uh, a little bit of what kind of work that uh, we've been doing. I'm trying. <laughs> All right, here it is. So I'll try to just, I'm going to throw a bunch of information, just get you stimulated a little bit. Um, first of all, in uh, deer ticks, this is not the complete list now of what you can find in, in a single tick. Um, the top four, probably most people have heard of, Lyme, Anaplasma, Lichia, and Babesia are the main ones. Um, the other ones we pick up at, at different, uh, different um, regions, but also sometimes it's less common we get them in, in, in the ticks around here. And uh, let's just see quicker. Um, one thing to realize is that uh, ticks, when we've analyzed ticks, 32% of them have more than one uh, disease in them. This is just one particular survey of about 100 ticks. Um, so there's, there's a mixture. And that's why you've heard your friends have multiple infections. It could have well been a, from one tick that caused all those infections to be transmitted. Naturally, it could have also been from several ticks. You can get bitten by more than one tick, get more than one disease. Um, the research that we're doing is a, it's a very uh, exciting technology. Uh, as you know, we, you have to order the right test to find a disease, right? You go to the doctor, if they don't order the Lyme test, you don't get the Lyme diagnosis. But the technology we're using actually enables you just to say what's in there and it tells you what comes out. It's almost like the cat in the hat. It's incredible technology. It's not in a commercial lab, and we're trying to get this work done in order to get it to have FDA approval. Um, I just want to quickly go through ticks, because I think everyone needs to be a, a reminder of how, how they work. Uh, ticks, it's all about the ticks, basically. Um, first of all, the basic lifestyle of a, of a deer tick, of an Ixodes tick, is two years. What that means is when the, the eggs get laid in the spring, and in the early spring the larvae are running around, they do not carry Lyme disease. I'll repeat, they do not carry Lyme disease. I know a lot of people ask questions, some people ask questions about that, but I'll say one more time, they do not carry Lyme disease. They might carry something else, but this comes up later, later on. Larvae go after small animals near the ground because they're near the ground. They don't climb up on the grass. They're way too small and they just stay where they're laid and whatever beast comes by, they will, they'll pick up on it. It tends to be birds. It tends to be small mice, uh, small rodents. Then towards the, towards the fall, they feed and then they become a nymph. They only feed once per molting period. So there's three stages, larvae, nymph, adult. They don't feed twice. So the reason why larvae doesn't transmit disease, Lyme disease, is because even if it, if it bites an infected animal, it's not going to do anything until it molts into a nymph. The nymphs are the ones that come around in the springtime, and they wake up, and that's when we get, well, that's when we get the majority of our infections are from the nymphs. So in the springtime, again, the next year, they go after everything, and they're, they're aggressive, and they, they'll get all of us, all animals, all people, pets. Then one-time feeding, they molt into adults in the fall. Adults might bite in the fall or again in the spring, but they are, they are not as aggressive as the nymphs. So in the fall is where they meet the deer. Why, where does the deer all come in here? The deer is very interesting, is that it's actually the meeting ground for the male and the female ticks, for the adults. So it's basically like going down to a uh, public house or one of these places here. <laughs> it's the place where people, it's where they meet. If you think about it, it's a big wide forest and for a male and a female tick to kind of mosey along and run into each other, be, you know, it'd be a tough way to go. So th this, is, this is nature's ecology, this is how our ecosystem works, and this is nature's way of having ticks meet and that's, and that's where they, the female, she, she usually does most of the biting on the deer, gets you know, engorged, mates with the male to fall off, and then they produce the eggs. So that's how it works. And those are the stages from larvae, little larvae, nymph, female, engorged. And those are the eggs. 
thousands, thousands, three, four, five, six thousand, lots of eggs. Um, most of you have seen these pictures. We have cards to hand out and all that, so I'll just be real brief. The three main types are the Exodes, which carries the Lyme disease, the Lone Star, Amblyoma, which carries the Ehrlichiosis, and then we have the Dog Tick, which carries the Rocky Mountain, and, and, and a couple other, Tularemia, a couple other diseases. Where do they like to hang out? That's a good thing to know. They actually like the high grass for the adults, but mostly the ticks are, you know, they're small insects. They don't like to dry out. They die if they dry out. So they like moister areas. So they tend to be under leaves and backyards in the shade and so forth. And Mr. Simon is going to give you a little more clues based on this, based on this type of information. And they also, if you think about it, you know, where do robbers go to go to get money? They go to the bank and the bank is on an animal trail. That's where the animals are. So, you know, we worry about staying to the trail, but we're actually walking where the ticks are, if you think about it. But this isn't a hard and fast rule, but they do tend to be on animal trails. So if you're following a deer trail, deer tracks are more likely to run, you know, have more tick exposure. Um, and they like golf courses, I think, from what I hear, so. <laughs> uh, basically, um, so they don't care for dry areas, windy. If it's a pine floor that's, you know, very dried with thistles, um, beaches, rocks and pebbles. And sure enough, I've seen ticks on the beach. I mean, it's no question. But they aren't all hanging out there. You're not going to see the, the, the numbers that you're going to see in the, in the forest, your overall. So as uh, Pliny the Elder once said, that ticks are the foulest and nastiest creatures that be. And in, since that time, no, no one's ever disagreed with them. What you have here is their, like a proboscis. And if you kind of look at it, just to get, I want to get a little technical with you. This is what goes in, this area here. This is their head. So their head is actually never really in you, in you. It's the, that piece in you. And it really isn't necessarily going to carry disease. So that little piece that's left that we all go crazy over, it's not like it's going to make your risk of disease any higher. It's in, it's in, it's, it's or not. It's not necessarily going to, we don't have any evidence that's going to increase your transmission rate by that piece sticking in there. But what they have with them is, is a very sophisticated uh, form of life. They have their salivary glands, which are very complex, more than ours. They have many different chemicals that they can secrete. And they create a feeding pool, like a pool of blood. And that takes time as well. And that's all part of this process of why it takes longer to transmit um, the disease. This is another factor that has to come into place. And what they do is then they create their own cement that that seals the area, so that's why they're hard to pull off. It's not like they can voluntarily back out because they want to stick in there. They are stuck, and they're cemented in. So you have to bear that in mind when you're removing a tick, that, it's, that that's what you're dealing with. You can't you know, burn it or trash it or scare it. It's not going to just jump out. And what they have, though, is chemicals in there that react with your immune system to diminish the response, similar to as if as you know, if you had a, you have the smallest little splinter in your, in your skin, how, how annoying that is. Why doesn't a tick feel annoying? It's because it has these, these molecules that suppress that inflammatory response and they numb it so you, you don't perceive it as much. And that's why they can stay in there for so long. And afterwards, yeah, they do have an inch that lasts a while after they left that cement and the chemicals that whatever's left over, you begin to react to after a time. But initially, they are really are very sophisticated and how they can suppress your immune response and allowing diseases to spread. And they, they really have a purpose. In, they have a higher purpose than we really realize in, in life. And you know how we like bees and we say bees are good for honey, but what they're really for is to keep the world alive by pollinating things. Likewise, we think of ticks as you know, things that give us diseases, but the real thing is what they're doing is probably pollinating between animals and species. They're transferring viruses and bugs. That's all they do is go from one beast to another, one, form of life to other to transfer information. And I'm getting really into high science, but it, it really makes sense when you think about evolution and where, where they come from. So basically, usually they feed towards the end of their attachment. And as I said before, they feed once when they molt. So there's an example of the salivary glands. It's not like you or I, where it's this little gland on the side of our cheeks. It's, their whole body is a salivary gland, so they're one big system for, for, for this. Let me just go and switch over a bit here. Uh, hopefully this will work. And, 
So, so I'm going to switch gears from ticks now to what they carry. And first of all, I want to talk about is what we mostly know about is Lyme, because that's all we've been focused on for the past 20 years. Um, now we're at a point now where we have to broaden our view and look at all what's going on in ticks and realize not everything is Lyme that we get from a tick. So there's uh, many strains. And of this, of this certain class of organism, the Borrelia species, many are found in uh, Europe and Euro in Asia. It's around the world. The main strain we have is Burgdorfi, and the other strains are more in Europe. And they cause similar symptoms, but also they tend to cause their own more evidence of neurological symptoms. This is what we found up to now, what we know about Lyme disease. We know that you, there's about A through K are different strains of Lyme. And we know now that when you isolate that from a tick, that you don't always find it in a skin or in a person when we do skin biopsies or do studies of, of people, of their blood and what they're infected with. We now know that, oops, here. We now know that of all these, a sh smaller list actually invades into the skin, that actually infects the skin. And then out of that group, smaller number strains are actually invasive. They actually go into your system. So in other words, there are rashes that some of us have that do not ever turn into a disease. The only thing is we don't know which one is which. We just know this at a molecular level now. We've been able to come to these conclusions. In our region, we've broken down these types of species or genotypes of Lyme disease in different regions. So what you have up here is New York, Connecticut, Indiana, California. The color correlates to a certain what we call genotype or strain. As you can see, New York and Connecticut share a bit here, but not so much with Indiana or California. And you can just kind of you know, look back and forth at each of the colors and begin to see that there are different patterns, there's different species in different regions. So it is, ticks carry a different form of Lyme in different areas of the country which complicates the picture, but also it gives us more insight. With between New York and uh, Connecticut, we have clearly an overlap and a difference. And so in New York, about half of our ticks carry a, a strain of Lyme that's unique to New York. And in Connecticut, about a fifth carry unique. And then we share about 50% between us. So one thing, too, is that within one tick, you can have more than one strain. So potentially, you could have two strains being infected by two strains of Lyme at the same time. And we don't know the implications of that, but that's something we now have a sense now of where we need to go next in terms of what we research, that perhaps two strains at the same time has a different effect on our immune system and has different outcomes. This was a study that was done only on ticks, and it was, this, again, this, this technology that you would not be able to get this information otherwise. We were able to look inside ticks. And these are all Ixodes. We're not talking Lone Star. We're not talking Doc Ticks or any of the others. But basically, um, here. half of them, roughly, were just one strain, one organism. The other ones? Almost a third were mixtures of different organisms. And without going into a lot of detail, lo and behold, Miyamoto is hidden in there too. That was found by this technology before it was discovered in a human case out here. Um, so in summary, we found it has numerous genotypes or strains. And some of them have been shown to persist longer in mice study models and affect disease severity in humans. And the mixtures of these genotypes may challenge their immune system in, in different ways. So Miyamoto, new kid on the block. One thing I want to say, because we talk about emerging diseases, I think it's important to go back to what uh, Dr. Fernando just said, 15 million years ago they were around. It's not, these are not new diseases. They're emerging because we are now having the diagnostic ability to, to know what they are. So it's actually a good thing. It's not a scary, horrible thing that a new thing's coming from outer space and attacking us. It already is here. We're just becoming more aware of it. And that's a good thing. So Miyamoto was first uh, 
uh, published in New England Journal about a year ago, and it was, however, someone who was a suppressed immune system, so they got very ill. That doesn't mean everybody's going to get very ill like that. Another case was then presented after that, which seemed that it, it came very sick and it seemed more like someone who is, um, has one of the Ehrlichia, one of the other tick diseases. So we're still trying to sort out how much is it like Lyme or not. We know that it's uh, in the same family, very close. If you look here in the spirochete family, treponema is uh, syphilis, but then it's kind of hard to see there. The, the lice carry a, a bugs called relapsing, fem uh, relapsing fever, and that's all these Borrelia down here. And then Miyamotoi is in the relapsing fever Borrelia company, but it's also transmitted by the same tick. That's how it all works. Um, first time it was ever even discovered was in Japan, 1995. All these diseases are going to be ubiquitous worldwide. We just happen to be living in an environment here that gives us more exposure. Um, another case, the next human case was really in Russia. Interesting thing about it, in the laboratory you can't grow it. So that's what's frustrating. That's why it hasn't been easily discovered, because you just can't grow it and find it. You need very advanced molecular techniques to be able to get to it. And this is unusual, we've just been reading, reading about, is they actually show evidence of transmission from the mother to the egg, which does not occur with Lyme. And I'm getting back to what I said three times before, why Lyme isn't transmitted from the mother to the egg, is now they're realizing that what they were picking up was probably in these tests that were very faintly positive, they were picking up, it was more, more likely it was Miyamotoi that was being transmitted. So we're getting more solid evidence in that, in that area. Um, relapsing fevers is what it's known for. You're ill, you have fevers, you get better, then it comes back again. And who knows? We don't know the whole spectrum of illnesses, but this may be one of the hidden players behind what we call chronic Lyme. We'll see. We're going to find more information. We have a lab that are, uh, that's going to be uh, here. Uh, South Haddon Hospital has a, a very good relationship with a lab that's completely specialized in tick disease in Massachusetts. Um, and that lab has got roots in uh, Mass General, and it's very good, and it's basically uh, has that available test now for us to use. So we're alerting all of our colleagues that let's order this test this year along with everything else we usually order and we'll see how many cases we pick up. Um, this uh, lab reports that last year they, they tried it in um, at a hospital as, a, as, a, as its first use um, in uh, uh, Nantucket area, uh, Cape Cod, and they found that um, they uh, had, uh, let's see, I might have lost that slide. There it is. About, they got about 50, with their new molecular test, about 50 cases of Lyme were picked up early. So this is a new test that's improving in the technique of detecting earlier than before. And in addition, though, they found the, the Miyamotoi also, about half, another half of that were actually Miyamotoi. So that's a, if, that's, if that's valid, that's a pretty significant number of cases compared to before when we didn't detect it at all. Um, next organism, Heartland virus. I don't know if anyone's heard of that or not, but I figure I'd throw it in so we stay up to date. In uh, Missouri, they found some cases a couple years ago, and uh, they're, they're looking at it. It's a virus, and viruses are very different than bacteria. And, um, they basically, out of those cases, they collected the ticks and the whole region around these index cases of farmers that got very ill. And uh, they sequenced it, and they found out that a lot of them were correlated to Lone Star, Amblyoma americanum. And they sequenced it and found that it was very similar to what was in the humans that got very sick. They were able to connect, connect the DNA and make the connection. So it looks like it's there. That's in Missouri. We, we haven't had anything around here. Bottom line is, Lone Star is an emerging vector, and we need more re research on the Lone Star. Um, I think we've all realized that you may find yourselves, if you get better looking at ticks, the Lone Star in the past two or three years has just taken over, taken over the area. I've, it's, tremendous, tremendous rise in this, this particular tick that didn't really even, wasn't even here a few years ago. It's not even here in Connecticut, it's not in Connecticut yet. But it's bringing in new diseases. And 
we have to really stay on top of this and put our research and our efforts towards learning about the new diseases and not get too dragged down in the past about it. I think that uh, we have to get better identifying ticks so we know what we have. It's not a little dark tick must be a Lyme disease tick. It's, it's, it could be many different ticks that are larvae or nymphs of different species and we need to know more about that. And bottom line is that a real problem is ecological and the only way it's going to be solved is politically. So that's my talk. Uh, my name was uh, Jerry Simons, as you heard. I'm going to try to be quick because I know it's hard to sit for this long, especially if you don't feel good. But just a quick survey. Who's had more than two or three ticks so far on them? Oh yep. God. There you go. <laughs> Who's uh, being treated for Lyme today? Who took their doxy this morning? Okay. It's about a third of people right there. So um, I'm going to kind of go over prevention. I made it as a handout. I want you to take the handout to the store when you're buying products or walk around your yard, get some guidance, uh, get some guidelines that way. Um, but first, you know, we just want to thank you for uh, definitely supporting our um, center here. And we're going to take a quick quiz just to make sure you're awake. So what's the most important way to prevent transmission of Lyme? Is it to have guinea hens, which is the new hot pet of the Hamptons this year? Uh, is it B, during a Hamptons vacation, only go sailing or to the beach, nowhere where there's grass? Is it C, do t frequent tick checks? D, tuck socks into your pants, or any of those with teenagers at home, just give in, mom and dad, give it up, it's over. Just have the kids stay inside all summer and let them play Minecraft, okay? So uh, we're gonna try to figure out that answer, so don't fall asleep yet. Okay, so again, we all know the ticks are super, super tiny and small. That's our problem is you might have a tick on you and you may never know about it. So tick-borne diseases are almost totally preventable. Yes, it's 2014, so we have to use the word almost. Center for Disease Control in their Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report has, has uh, reported about transplacental mom to baby transmission of Lyme. La Leche League has a document about Lyme being in breast milk. And of course, as uh, we've been talking about two or three times today, um, Lyme disease, its close cousin is syphilis. Uh, they behave very similarly. Are there some issues with Lyme disease being sexually transmitted? I've seen husbands or wives being treated for Lyme and their spouse comes in with very similar symptoms, but they've never really known if they've had a tick on them. And uh, Dr. Dempsey and I on Friday night will hang out and just enjoy the Tick Encounter website together. It's an amazing resource. And one of the great things on their website is they say one bite can make you sick and change your life. So think about that. So a couple of interesting pointer. It is an old Hamptons legend, but I really think that it's true. Ticks hate the scent of lavender. Lavender soap, lavender detergent, lavender dryer sheets, shampoo. You know, I have two kids and I let them go out and do things, but they have lavender dryer sheets in their pocket, in their shoes. I think uh, scent of lavender, ticks don't seem to like it. You know, also protecting your skin. Use something on your skin, uh, whether it's a, a type of DEET or your favorite natural repellent. Use permethrin uh, very heavily on your clothes. Ticks definitely hate that. Two layers of protection, using something on your skin and using something on your clothes um, is kind of a big deal. And there are actually clothes. You can go to the store and buy clothes that already have built-in types of tick repellent on them. So seriously, think about that. Use some kind of repellent uh, when you're out there for sure. Also, we know that mice are one of the big vectors. Mice are one of the big vectors. If you get rid of wood piles and uh, piles of old leaves and places where mice live, you're going to have a lot less of the ticks that transmit infection. Also, new studies show that ticks um, also love to live on chipmunks. So. No offense to Chip and Dale, but chipmunks are also a big vector. And as Dr. Dempsey pointed out, birds also can carry ticks. Many of you saw the 
Jerry Simon's Wanted poster in Agway in Bridgehampton they had hung up over the cashier. I've been preaching against bird baths and bird feeders and bird foods for years and local hardware stores can't sell bird food or bird feeders or, or bird baths anymore because people know if you make a choice to have those things in your yard, you're making a choice to have more ticks in there also. So definitely getting rid of those vectors. Um, the little mice there are the ones that definitely are carrying the ticks that we're definitely worried about. They definitely increase in the trans disease transmission. And, you know, I drive up and down Route 114 all the time. There's lots of trails there. You see people biking with shorts and t-shirts walking through the woods. So you can make smart choices and not go where ticks live. Another famous thing, all of our landscapers and tick prevention people know that ticks are relatively lazy. They're going to quest on a blade of grass or a tree and wait for somebody to brush up against them. So that famous three foot wood chip border, if you have a three foot border of wood chips around your house and you have that area sprayed regularly, ticks are really not going to want to crawl over that. They don't have the motivation to cross that. Yes, you, I have a, a, a swing set. My kids go outside and they're playing, but it's all wood chip. It's got a little wood chip protective area around it. And even the Center for Disease Control has said, unless it's freezing, like below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you can still have ticks being active. So the CDC reminds us that don't just be careful Memorial Day until Halloween, be careful all year round. If you look very carefully, you can kind of see that tick is still hanging out there in the snow. It's still looking to definitely be hungry. So again, you know the high-risk areas. If you do make a choice to walk in the trails, try to stay in the center. Do chick checks very often. Wear long pants, tuck them into your socks. That's a great style. How do you really know you're from the Hamptons? You go to a party and your socks are tucked into your, and your pants are suck, tucked into your socks just because it's a fashion statement. We all do it light colored clothing, you know, and also knit clothes, heavier clothes that ticks can bite onto, you know, use lighter, more sheer clothing that it's hard for them to, to bite onto. Right, there's the tick, it's there, it's hanging out, it's waiting for you to brush up against it. We do know that the Lone Star ticks tend to be a little more aggressive and move around a little bit more than others, but most of the time you're gonna have to brush up against something or come in contact with something you might make that foolish choice to let your pets sleep in the bed with you, um, and that's gonna have their ticks uh, being further exposed to you that way, okay? So again, prevention's important. The ticks are so small, you might not know that you've had a tick on you until you don't feel good or you've actually had a rash. Very important, if you choose to do anything, treat your shoes. Get permethrin, like we love Sawyer's, that thing in the, the yellow container. Spray your shoes once or twice a month. Ticks generally start low and work their way up. It's rare for them to start at your ear. So if anything, make sure you're treating your shoes to keep the ticks off of you. And as Dr. Knott pointed out, right now, you guys, we're living it. We're living the dream. We're in the peak season of Lyme. May through July are when we have the most nymphal. They're really hungry and they're very aggressive that way. This, we kind of went over this uh, life cycle already, but if you have the handout, I'll just make a few brief pointers and then we'll start with our, uh, with our Q and A. So again, on that first page there, as I said on the property, go home today. What are you gonna do today, people? Focus, listen. You're gonna get rid of your wood pile. You're gonna get rid of rock walls, bird feeders, bird baths, get rid of anything. Why invite them voluntarily into your, into your yard? Okay, make that three foot wood chip border all around. Okay, you can collect toilet paper tubes and impregnate them with the Sawyer's permethrin and put cotton balls in there. The ticks will be, become attracted to that and they'll bring them, I'm sorry, the mice will get attracted to those cotton balls, bring them to their nest and that's gonna be able to kill the ticks. Permethrin um, originally comes from chrysanthemums, so it's not that uh, really bad off. Number two, treat your skin. I like Buzz Away Extreme. It's an it's a all-natural thing. I cover it with my kids. You can use DEET, uh, Environmental Working Group. It's a very liberal group that's anti-chemical. Actually, on their website, I checked this morning, they're like, we support DEET 
30% concentration or less. So uh, DEET on the skin, permethrin on your clothing, you're gonna see a dramatic decrease in the number of ticks uh, that are on there. Don't overuse, don't buy DEET more than 30% in my opinion though. I made a little picture of the most famous areas where ticks bite you, like the head, the armpit, the groin, the knee, you know, things like that. You know, Dr. Dempsey was saying maybe you're going over to the bar and you're trying to pick up someone, right? What's the great Hamptons pickup line? Hey, can you come home with me? I need you to do a tick check. And <laughs> these are the areas that you need to check, okay? Hey, I've been married almost 20 years. It worked for me, okay? So there's a great blurb about your pets, okay? I don't have time to get into your pets, but there's a lot of great info. Um, be very careful treating your cats. They don't really like chemicals, but there's a wide variety of different things that are out there to really use on your dog. Ask your vet, okay? The final thoughts on the last page, guys, take a breath and read final thought number one. Do not let the fear of ticks destroy your summer, okay? Use all the common sense we've told you about. You can go out there and have a good time. Just try to be smart about it, okay? You know, use repellent, avoid tick areas, make conscious choices. You know, number, uh, number three, could a vaccine work for prevention? In theory, it could, but Dr. Dempsey was saying there's almost a dozen strains of Lyme, there's viruses, there's Ehrlichia, Bartonella. You know, for a vaccine to really work and totally protect you, it'd have to cover all of these diseases. And imagine a vaccine that would have to cover 30 different diseases, developing that how long would it last and work, the cost. So it is a great dream and people are working on it. So we're gonna see what comes of it. And number four, uh, Karen's been really working on our tick-borne disease website. Dr. McGinty's got a great article on this meat allergy that everybody is talking about. So make sure you go there tonight, click on that, donate, support us. You know, we're all here volunteering. You know, we're not making money out of this. We're here to help you, so you know, maybe give us 20 bucks to help get this thing off the ground. Think about it, okay? All right, you guys, so it's all on here. Go home today, read it, do the right thing all the time, okay? And I think we'll open up for the questions. So what was the correct answer to your quiz? Oh, do, great, thank you, Bob. Uh, do regular tick checks. As soon as you find the tick, take it off of you. So, mm -hmm. great. Thank you very much, Derek. Well, I'd uh, sincerely like to thank our panelists. One more round of applause, please, for the great job that they've done. And as I said, this will be an introductory uh, session for all of you. There's a lot more information out there, and we will be continuing to evolve the Resource Center and getting you more information over time and uh, certainly with follow-up for any questions that we can't answer today. So I'd like to open it up for questions. If you could go over to the microphone, please, and line up for your questions, um, because we are recording this and would like the folks at home to be able to hear those questions as well. And if you'd like to direct it to the entire panel or any one particular speaker. Uh, if, if we were to go out and collect 100 ticks, how many of them would be infected? Question, George. Question. I think uh, most of them, of something. Say, I would say about sixty percent. Yeah, but they all have they, they all have organisms in them. So infected, you meaning with a disease that you would could get, but all ticks are, have are always carrying organisms in them. That's what they do, yeah. Good morning, my name is Tommy John Scavone. I'm from the village of North Haven. I have a question about uh, reporting. Are doctors required to report Lyme's disease and other tick-borne illnesses to, I guess, to the CDC? Dr. Fernando? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, there's a, a spot of controversy that we're in right now where they're actually saying Lyme disease is no longer a reportable disease. And that comes in the situation where the CDC in the prior went up from 30,000 to 300,000. 
and now they're starting to say it's not reportable. So that's a, that's a spark of controversy uh, at the moment. But uh, we'll definitely, you know, through our resource center, we'll definitely keep you posted. Well, my question is, I guess, you know, uh, Dr. Dempsey, you said that the uh, solution is political. Can local municipalities get actual empirical data on the amount of people within their jur jurisdiction who are infected with various? Yeah, I, uh, the political uh, thing is out of the scope of our discussion at this point. Uh, we're mostly a resource center, but I'd be happy to, over, uh, over a cup of coffee, I'd be happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, my name is Rena Rosenfeld, and I like to consider myself as a political activist for Lyme's disease. Um, Mr. Chowner, I really want to thank you because you're one of the first officials that came out with a comment that, at the beginning when you spoke, that this is an epidemic. And our political officials, do we have one political official here in the audience? I'm curious. I find that shameful that something as nice as this presentation is being done and there's not one political official here. CDC underreported because the doctors didn't understand how to report Lyme's disease. Um, the doctor over there, excuse me for pointing, you mentioned allergy to meat. The Afagal has not been mentioned other than once here. That's an allergy to meat that people develop from Lyme's disease. And what happens is there's a lack of breathing. It's a very dangerous disease, and you do end up in Southampton Hospital. So in summation with everything, um, we have the same drug that we've used over 30 years, the same blood disease that we're given for the past 30 years, no vaccine for at least one type of a Lyme disease. Um, education is important, but so is action. And I'm asking for some help here. I still don't see the politicos here. Thank you very much, and thank you for that comment. We do have an epidemic. It's not a health crisis. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I will say that <laughs> our resource center will be a, um, an attempt to educate the entire community, and we have had a, a number of discussions with a number of our elected officials, and we'll continue to, and they're very interested in learning more about it. So I, I agree we need, to, we need to raise the awareness with, uh, with everyone in our community. Next question, please. And please, yes. if I can remind everybody two questions. And, uh, yeah. So my name is Anne Vancouvering. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I work with a lot of Lyme people, and thank you for doing this. This is great. Um, I just have a question. I see a lot of uh, people come in with Bartonella, and I didn't see it on the lists, and I don't see it on those CDC lists, and why is that? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. I don't know put it there, I'm just not sure about it. We're not sure it's a tick-borne disease, or we're not sure? Okay. They don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. Okay. We, we actually sent that out for, you know, patients where uh, Bar Bartonella serology, like you, you pointed out, in a, in a patient with uh, tick-borne disease, which we're not able to isolate something. Uh, it's probably not a first-line uh, ser serological test or blood test that we do when someone comes in, but definitely if someone is uh, persistently symptomatic, uh, we definitely o uh, order it on our second visit. Uh, turns out the treatment is pretty similar. Doxycycline works great. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Thank you all very much for doing this presentation. Um, I have a question from a prevention perspective. Um, I've learned about something called a four poster for treating the deer with permethrin, and I'm trying to find out more information about it. I keep coming up against dead ends. Um, is there any information out there, or maybe anyone here who has information? So uh, the four poster system actually is a feeding system for deer. They used it in Shelter Island and I think on Fire Island. And the idea is just to coat the neck of the deer with the permethrin so when the ticks come in contact with them, those ticks will end up shriveling up and die. Uh, they don't really have data on just how much the tick reduction has been, but they know in certain areas where they've used the four poster system, there's been a lot less people that have been getting sick. But again, you have to use it for the entire two-year life cycle of a tick for it to be able to um, really have a full preventative measure. So basically, the permethrin, which we said is rooted in chrysanthemum, is basically harmless uh, for the deer. Uh, it doesn't hurt them, and the deer are getting free food out of it, so they kind of like that idea also. And hopefully we're reducing that second year of the life cycle, like Dr. Dempsey was saying, by destroying the 
the, the bar, the meeting ground of the male and the female tick. So I think that it's something that once it gets more community approval that we're going to be using a lot more of it. Is that something that I could build myself, you know, uh, are there plans or, you know, that tell you how much permethrin to use? Right. Actually, the best thing to use in your yard, uh, something that the CDC uh, helped to develop, which are these little uh, tick boxes. It's like a little maze that mice and tip, tick, uh, that uh, chipmunks run, run through, and it coats them with permethrin, and I have that info in the handout. That's the best thing. You put a couple of those around in your yard, and that has the greatest scientific data to reducing the amount of ticks. So thank you. Putting a four poster system in your yard would just invite more deer into your into your yard. Hello everyone. Oh wow. Um this is really uh difficult for me. I'm gonna be try to really be quick. Um my Lyme experience, I'm sure everyone has dealt with um, you know, the many symptoms that come with Lyme. Uh I'm gonna try to make this quick. I have a two part question. Um the first part of it is um how do you explain when a patient goes to the doctor numerous times, get neg neg negative results, and then starts on medication and does get better if it's not Lyme? Because that's, that's my story. I've been told I didn't have Lyme. I've been told that um, it was all in my head. Um, then yeah. then um, I had severe burning throughout my body. That was the last thing that I had that took me to the hospital every single night, um, my mother and my family. Um, I'm getting better, but how can you say it's not Lyme, then you get treatment for Lyme and you get better? That's a great question. And the answer to that really is, uh, like Dr. Dempsey pointed out in his slides, uh, there are a lot of co-infections. And uh, the, what, of course, what we talk about all the time in this part of the island is uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is Lyme disease. But I will tell you, this, uh, this if Jesus were to put me on an island and say, Rajiv, I'm going to put you on an island, but I'm in a good mood, I'm going to give you one antibiotic. And I choose doxycycline. It's one, of the, it's one of the miraculous drugs from the 1960s, which treats a lot of other tick-borne diseases. So even if your Lyme serologies come back negative, like Dr. Dempsey pointed out in his slides, you may have another tick-borne disease, and you're going to get better with that. But those so, came back negative as well. Well, there are so many, and it's all in evolution. There, there's more and more ticks we're learning about as the months go by. And like I said, we're in the we're in the thick of things over here. We that's why we work with a lot of researchers. Uh, I don't say that we have all the answers, but definitely we look for it. And uh, definitely, it could be one of those diseases which you know hasn't come to the forefront yet. I'll just say this, yeah. but I did test with Igenix, and I came back CDC positive. Of course, with of six course. Yeah, bands. Of course. Yeah. But why do you guys not respect? Hygienics when it's no, it's, CDC, and it's not. It's um, it's uh, among the infectious disease world. Uh, I mean, or even a lot of the primary care physicians, we know that uh, this is a test which people resort to, uh, or physicians resort to when, unfortunately, they want to start you know months and months of intravenous therapy for. Um, for their businesses. Th this is my experience, and there's a lot, uh, not to be dis disrespectful of anything, but we c this is a, probably a longer discussion. We can mm -hmm. chat more. The other purpose. part, uh, quickly, um, yeah. the other part, how do you know you're getting the right treatment? Because my doctor, he told me just take three weeks of antibiotics and that, that would take it out. Yeah, that, that's H a How good could question. that be the same treatment for somebody that has Lyme for a longer time? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, we're seeing this uh, syndrome that's called uh, post-Lyme uh, syndrome, which is evolving, and we're understanding that. Uh, any sort of literature really says two to three weeks, like you pointed out, three weeks of antibiotics will suffice. But there are still people who have neurocognitive uh, Im uh, impairment after, you know, m uh, weeks into p after this therapy, about 55% of people sometimes just still experience just not feeling great. Fatigue. I've met several people that have had yeah, symptoms I, for I, years. And I concur going, with you. I really do. You know. uh, there's newer uh, treatments out there, which we're learning about. I just read a study from Germany yesterday where they're actually saying to give an antifungal. It's called fluconazole for these kind of syndromes. So we're, we're learning. Uh, and like I said, it's only uh, been since the, you know, since the um, mid-80s that it was actually a reportable disease, and we're learning. And, you know, that's why we want to get the best care there is out there, and that's why we established this panel. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next question. Just uh, one other pointing about testing. Remember, if you go to the CDC website, they remind you that Lyme is a clinical diagnosis, and the testing is only a support of that. So if you've got all the symptoms and 
you know, that even if your test is negative, what does the CDC say? So clinical diagnosis. Hi, where can we buy Promethrian? Did I read that wrong? It sounded like you can spray it on your clothes, or is that, does that come in an insecticide already as a chemical that's already in it, or you buy it in itself? Right, Not, no uh, endorsement, but I have every month Amazon gives me three bottles of the Sawyer's Promethrin. It's already pre-mixed. Or for those of you who are adventurous, if you go to Riverhead the, in Lowe's, they have it, a Promethrin, and you can just mix it yourself. So You can mix it and just spray it on your clothes? Uh, yep. It's got a, a formula. You can hook it up to your hose and spray your yard. You can mix it in a spray bottle, sneakers, socks, shoes. You can do it all that way. Southampton has a couple of great tick control companies. They drive around with the big trucks uh, with it and they just spray your yard. So online, hardware store, you can get it that way. Thank you. Hi, I think we're my down name is Beverly four, Shand, four final questions. I live in Sag Harbor. The last time I got a tick bite, which was recently, my doctor gave me- Could you stand a little closer to oh, the I'm mic sorry. now? I'll, I'll start again. Um, uh, the last time I got a tick bite, my doctor gave me like a mega dose of doxycycline, just one, two pills instead of the usual two weeks. Has the protocol changed on the treatment of? Um no. Uh, I, 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 do, do you remember how quickly you presented to see your physician after the tick bite? It, it was the following day. Oh, yes, absolutely. Like we discussed before, uh, it takes anywhere from 36 hours to go from the, from the, uh, for the, for the Borrelia in the mid gut of the tick to get to the mouth part. So you're totally right. in that window period. But previously period. it was like the two week treatment and this time he said, you know. Yeah, you might have, it might have been a different window period or um, it might have been his decision at the time. The, you know, they, the clinician like uh, Jerry mentioned is it's a clinical disease. He might have been, a, you might have been in a different situation, but uh, it com he was completely appropriate with your therapy this time. Thank you. I'd just like to make one comment about the prophylactic uh, antibiotics. Um, one of the uh, ways that I've also, through experience, have been burned a couple of times with Lyme disease, is especially out here in July and August, which there's so many ticks, the patient comes to me and say, this was the tick that got me, you know, and, and I used to give the two tablets of doxycycline. Um, I, I shy away from that practice now just because my experience has been yeah, I will have treated them, and some of these patients have come back, you know, a couple of weeks later with a Bell's palsy or whatever the symptoms of early Lyme, and I will have under-treated them. So just with the sheer number of ticks and the uh, probability that, you know, you, you find one tick on you, chances are there's been other ticks on you that have, that have bitten you. I'm, I'm personally a little more cautious with, uh, with how I do the prophylactic Two antibiotics. Two weeks. Okay. Thank but you. Yeah, right. Next question. My name is Carol McNally. I was treated for Lyme's uh, babesiosis and Bartonella by Dr. Barascano, but he's no longer here. And I did was treated also. Um, Jerry Simmons was the PA on there. I just this question is for Jerry. Are you still taking patients that have chronic Lyme's, or is that not so? Uh, actually, as of right now, I'm not taking any new patients. But our office is still open. We have other people that kind of follow our methods. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are there any doctors that um, take patients that have chronic Lyme's on well, this? Doctor Fernando is our infectious disease doctor. So, is he familiar with Bartonella? Are you familiar with Bartonella? Yeah, yeah, we we see a lot of Bartonella cases. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, uh, it's a very common um, tick. If you can't, if you do a workup for the top five tick diseases that you come up with here that we commonly diagnose, it's it's in my second uh, office visit for a patient if those serologies come what back I, What I'd probably recommend, ma'am, is um, just because we probably want to learn a little bit more about your life history and what happened, it would be a good idea to speak to Debbie on the phone and she can guide you toward a physician, I think would probably be the right the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. Hi there, my name is Craig Mowry. Uh, I noticed that Dr. Dempsey is really the only one up there that sort of actually directly addressed chronic Lyme by name. 
And I'll tell you, I am a healthy dude. I'm about as healthy as you can get, running, skiing, etc. When my chronic Lyme begins, I go from zero to 100. I'm running up mountains, and then I'm in bed. Now, I mention this because I can go on YouTube, pull up six guys in their 20s who have my exact unusual group of symptoms, exact, right down the line. They're bizarre, and guess what? They have Lyme. I have Lyme. My question is, I have two guys, doctors, serious dudes, who are neurologists who treat Lyme. They tissue typed me, and they found patterns between, or at least they represent that, patterns in tissue type, like autoimmune, like RA, like rheumatoid, Certain people might be predisposed to be more susceptible to the chronic condition of Lyme based on, there was a question earlier about why are certain people maybe immune. I live in a community where everyone around me is half healthy, half sick. I'm one of the guys who got this chronic condition. Might tissue type be an issue and does anyone have anything to say about that? Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're getting the stuff that I love and <laughs> fortunately, fortunately I don't have it. <laughs> But um, yeah, the immune system is just, the more you look at it, the more fascinating it becomes. It, it, immunology is a changing field. It isn't a set thing we know everything in immunology. As of a few years, they discovered a new cell called a dendritic cell, which is a new component of the immune system that helps present uh, antigen, which is the abnormal thing, and says, this, I mean, it's just, everything's changing. We are very complex. Our immune system is very complex. So I, I'm personally, I, I'm very, pretty much convinced it's all about the immune system more than it is about the diseases and it's about understanding a particular person's immune system is where the next stage of medicine is going to go for many many diseases but I think that's where that's where it is I think that's where the money is except there's no money <laughs> Tony uh, I just want to make a comment um, so again going back to the scientific research that's been going on for the last 20 years to support you know your observation about yourself and, and people in the community when they for instance uh, the animals that are studied unfortunately as uh, that is uh, they recover uh, debris from spirochetes for instance in joint tissue and in other tissues of the body after the the animal has been treated um, and it's presumed treated adequately and then they have been looking at the immune system you know and and different parameters in the immune system and there's there's a wide range of possibilities of what can happen um, in terms of an immune re inflammatory response autoimmune disease that develops as a result of this um, but what they're finding is yes bits and pieces of spirochete and, and whatever effect that that has uh, on the animal and presumably, you know, on the human, this, this goes on and this, this defines this illness. Um, but it's, it's uh, just in its, again, infancy in, in terms of what we're discovering and, and how we explain uh, your symptoms and the symptoms of other people. It's very frustrating and big issue. As I said at the beginning, one of the challenges is there is much that's unknown. We would all like medicine to be a very simple, you know, do one test, get the answer, do a treatment, and it moves on. Our bodies are different. The tests are not always accurate at this point, and there's a lot of research that's still very, very much unknown. And part of our goal here is to not just sit and wait for information to trickle to us, but to have our panel of doctors actively look and find out what's going on out there so that we can bring better information to the community. And chronic Lyme disease is a difficult topic. A lot's not understood about it yet, and I'm sure it will be in a few years, and hopefully as we continue to, to research and, and collaborate, we will, know, we will know more about it. I guess I'm the last one. My name's Annie Zarin, and thank you so much for this panel today. It's been fabulous, and Karen, for your organizing it. Um, my question is this, how many of you believe in chronic Lyme disease? I'll be the first. I believe in a chronic disease. I don't know if it's where it's coming from. I, mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't like committing to something. I'm a non-committal person. Right. <laughs> so I don't like blaming it on that one bug when I know how much else is going on in the whole, mm -hmm. just in one tick, let right. alone in one environment. But it's the answer. To, but I also want to say yes. I do believe someone's chronically sick with something. We've got to figure out what it is. But you think it may not be Lyme. It may not be 
the, 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 it's not the same line they started out with. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different line, or whether it's the same bug that evolved, as some people think, or whether it set off a reaction, as some people think, or was it co-infected with something else that created a synergy? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, there's just so many possibilities. I don't like calling it a, I don't like calling it Lime. I think it's, I'd like to call it something else, mm -hmm. it. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great question, uh, and I'll I'll tell you my experience as um, as a fellow when I first started training. Um, I had two people uh, mentor me who are in the Infectious Disease Society of America who actually write the uh, guidelines for Lyme disease in this country, and just up front they told me no, doesn't exist. Um, and as soon as I come came to Long Island, which is about two two and a half years ago. Um, I I have changed my opinion, and obviously as a as a, as a fellow as a student at Dartmouth, uh, you know I was taught differently, but you know I've come to open my eyes, and I think definitely uh, a certain percentage of people do experience the syndrome, and it's important to uh, you know there are tons of research, and they say oh it doesn't exist and all this stuff, but I'm the one who's seeing the patient in front of me, and I definitely think there's a there isn't a, a component of chronicity that exists. And that's what we're here to figure this out and uh, help all our patients here and move forward. I definitely think there is a component of chronicity, definitely. Uh, well, I, I know that Lyme disease has, uh, in 10 years, given me a lot of humility, you know, as a doctor and humbled me because I, <coughs> uh, I know it's, it's beyond the scope of my understanding what's going on with a, with a percentage of my patients. You know, we all have, we all have these folks, so uh, you know it behooves the doctor out here to, to keep an open mind, um, certainly. And uh, uh, I, you know, George, uh, I think is how I feel in terms of yes, mm -hmm. there's something going on, and I think yeah, it's probably related to a tick-borne illness, or certainly could be strong possibility, but. But is it the you know inf inflammation after the fact? Is it autoimmune disease, um, as opposed to you know the spirochete is still somewhere inside of you, mm -hmm. you know creating havoc? I mean again going back to if you read this this uh, research and I have you know 25 papers on my desk that I've looked through, there's a, more of a suggestion now that it's you know it's not the if, if it's adequately treated initially and that's what you know treat early. Right, is but the a whole lot of us thing. aren't. You know, right. Our, our immune a lot of people come to come the attention then, late. There's know. a triggering event, right? Right. But yeah. we don't. There's a lot we don't know. Yeah. You know, we're all presented with folks that are suffering, as uh, you know, as great many are. But mm -hmm. uh, all we can say is yeah, something's going on. And well, uh, early, I I define early as that subset of patient that has had a previous negative Lyme test. I mean, negative IgM, negative IgG comes to me, headache, fever, fatigue, uh, within, yeah, or, you know, Bell's palsy. I do the Lyme test. I mean, this is the ones I'm certain about. And then they, their IgM becomes positive. You know, it's four all of a sudden. Um, you know, one of the practice, I think, you know, Lyme, Lyme folks do, they don't necessarily wait for the blood test results to come back. You'll start treating them right away. This is what I've been doing in Montauk. When a patient comes in with headache, fever, fatigue, I'm not, and I do that first blood test, if it's negative, I'm going to finish the course of the antibiotic. Um, because we're all, we're also very individualized, you know, our immune systems, our immune responses, is a whole other thing, you know. Um, I'm also, I just want to say that I'm amazed at how many people like, you know, Montauk folks don't have, you know, don't come in. I mean, that's the thing that blows me away, you know. Uh, so there's all this immune system, because I'm sure these people have been bitten by ticks. I mean, I have people, at landscapers that describe, you know, being covered in ticks, they never get the disease, and some people get it horrendously. So there's obviously, you know, I don't think those people have permethrin, you know, in their genes. I think they're somehow, they've been bitten and probably infected, but somehow their immune system works a little differently, as, as immune systems work differently in other diseases, too. Incidentally, doxycycline, uh, is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis uh, because doxycycline has a, uh, th these antibiotics also have other properties that, that treat inflammation that we're just, you know, we're just discovering. So patients have been referred to me from rheumatologists on doxycycline to treat the rheumatoid arthritis that would otherwise be treated with, 
you know, one of these uh, methotrexate or one of these other, you know, rheumatologic drugs. That's a whole other issue, too. People get better with antibiotics, but, you know, is it the inflammatory, uh, anti-inflammatory aspect of that antibiotic that we're, that's actually making them feel better? And just briefly to chime in, I don't like to use the word chronic. I use more the word persistent. There's something persistent going on. We've had people on Doxy, and we switch them to Mepron, which is an antiparasite, and they quickly get better. So was there a Babesia component going on? Well, like Dr. Knott said, we have people who take minicin, and they feel bad when they go off of minicin. Is it autoimmune? Is it anti-inflammatory? Is it infectious? We're still trying to figure that out. So but like Dr. Fernando said, we're all here. Just We really just want you guys to feel better. You know, That's why we're here on a... Saturday morning trying to help you out, you know? We're really down to the last two questions. Um, again, um, it's been said before, but I want to thank all of you from Southampton Hospital and everyone who's actually in the audience, too. The first time I knew about Lyme was at Southampton Hospital when there was a big medical symposium. I'm a clinical social worker, and I got diagnosed early on with long-term Lyme, and then it was connected to a Yale study. But my question is about the great mimicker, or you know how it, do you see, because I see it in my practice, anxiety, depression, panic attacks as part of a cluster that could be related to Lyme or any other the tick-borne illnesses? Well, I certainly think that in, in the Western medical literature, it's acknowledged that Lyme disease, when it infects the central nervous system, you can, you can uh, uh, manifest psychiatric symptoms. So, you know, along with that case I talked about, the, the woman that appeared to be having worsening dementia, right. you can have other subtle changes. So it is the great imitator, and you can have, uh, I had a patient that becomes severely depressed. Um, just like you can become depressed with a B12 deficiency, but I have had a patient that was severely depressed, treated for Lyme disease, and depression was relieved. Um, but, uh, you know, thyroid disease, there's, there's a lot of other possibilities. But yes, Lyme disease, when it gets into the central nervous system, because it can go anywhere and, you know, affect any part of the brain. So uh, it's, it's certainly possible. Well, that's why I'm continuously referring people for Lyme. <laughs> um, the second thing is about... Um, at the time, in the mid-'80s, um, Tony Bullock, anyone from East Hampton would know, we, were, we had a Lyme task force, and I was a member of it. And it was great. And so it's possible, again, to get our town supervisors, including the libraries and schools, to get reinvolved. So they used to have symposiums at the middle school in East Hampton. <coughs> I did a, a TV show on Lyme disease with all kinds of specialists. So I think it's great because you've given such new information Mation here about all the other tick-borne illnesses, and so I just really appreciate it and thank you. Thank you. Last question. Last question. Hi. Um, it's a two-part question. Um, for the family members that deal with um, financial uh, responsibilities, this can become a little pricey. And um, is there like any foundations or anybody that would help assist with like hyperbaric treatment or uh, I think it's the rife or riff machine like treatment or um, any places that um, maybe could help with like a financial solution like s sliding scale or something? Sure, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, at the moment, hyperbaric therapy, of course, we have a fantastic facility in Southampton Hospital for hyperbaric therapy. Right. Um, at the moment, there's no, uh, there's no indication for chronic Lyme disease, chronicity with Lyme disease to have that. But if there is an absolute need, I'm sure uh, the, the principle behind hyperbaric uh, uh, therapy is really giving a high percentage of oxygen to right. certain tissues to eradicate um, you know, these pathogens. Uh, it hasn't been studied well enough, but you know, I, I, of course, I deal with a case-by-case -case situation. And if there's ab any absolute need to do such a thing, I would definitely you know, look into it with my social worker colleagues and make sure the patient gets the right therapy. So basically, um, it would be like a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, absolutely. Okay. There's no standard recommendations at this time, but okay. I'd be happy to help. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. Thank you. But I think your question of is there are there resources out there is a good one, and uh, I'm not 
personally aware of a foundation, but it's something that we as a group can look into what additional financial resources are out there for folks who okay. can afford it. What I would say is if um, don't let fear of the financial issues scare you away if you've got something going on. Call, call, um, uh, call our tick hotline and let us see if we can we can help you out we don't have a immediately something i know where we can just pull money out of the air but we don't want people in our, you're our neighbors we don't want you wandering around sick and not being treated right thank you and then my second question was um in the hamptons we're a great community of like people we come together we have the parties and we fellowship and we do great things is there like one set hospital um day that will like come together and like talk about a cure together like trying to find like uh, i think somebody mentioned like a a vaccine or something is that like something we can look into it's it's one of those issues certainly the hospital is going to the actively bring you information i'm not sure that we've thought about a particular day to announce a cure or anything okay. like that i guess we'd probably just knowing the way healthcare works we'd be skeptical that there that will happen what i would say though is we're going to continue to provide more of these forums so that you've got the opportunity to get this information and and part of our mission as i said at the beginning is keeping our communities and our medical staff informed about the latest developments and that's really that's our our direction right now um and this and i'll summarize by saying that the the resource center is as i've said a very new opportunity venture for the hospital clearly from the size of the audience this is something that's important to this community and we will continue to grow and develop and we'd like your feedback over time also. If there are things that you are questioning or worried about, use the hotline, let us know, call my office, um, um, and we will, we will continue to develop programs. Um, we do wanna do it in a way that, as I said, is somewhat based on, on good scientific evidence, um, but we do also wanna try and get your questions answered. So um, use, use our resources. And if we're a little vague on specifics for you in a group setting, any medical practitioner would be hesitant without knowing more about you about just giving you an answer. And I think that's probably the responsible approach, but that's why we've set up the hotline. That's why we have Debbie Mela taking those questions. And, uh, and as I said, we will develop that navigator role. I'd like to thank you all thank for you. being here. Uh, please, a round of applause for our panel.